Thank you, Chloe and Marika. Ministry and music sets the tone for the message. You know, God gave us that example through the Bible. He set up the Kohathites who were set the tone before services, carried on the music in the Israelite economy, and carried and sang before going to battle. So music, the right kind of music, sets the tone. It's what kind of tone do we want to set it? Um, I ask you to please uh, silence or turn off your cell phones. And uh, you may want to get out a pen or pencil, or you can take a piece of paper or the back of your bulletin. Message that, you know, every time I'm asked to speak, I always ask the Lord to give me what will benefit me, what will do, what will help me in my walk with him, and also for each one of you, but more so I, for me, and he always lays a message on my heart, and <clears throat> before I um, go into the sermon today and what God has laid on my heart, just to let you know, I was reading um, our general conference president, Elder Ted Wilson, and his wife are over in the Philippines. And in Sabbath school, I've given a few mission stories about Madonna um, uh, Philippines. But he was over there yesterday with Sabbath over in the Philippines. And they baptized over 700 of the rebels that were rebellion, rebelling, that over 40-some thousand people have been killed. Over 40-some years, there's been rebels in the Philippines, and they've been fighting against the government. Well, they got a, they were able to get through AWR, Adventist World Mission, Adventist World Radio, get God pods, and they gave their hearts to the Lord. And yesterday, throughout the Philippines, there was a lot of meetings going on. There was over 2,000 baptisms in the Philippines. Is the latter rain fallen? It's beginning to fall. If it isn't falling around you or you aren't noticing it, then we need to check where our relationship is with God. It's a serious note that we need to th think about. Who is your coach? Well, at one time when I was young, I was really, you know, I had, I had done, I really liked competition and sports and stuff. And I know some of you in here have done sports and enjoyed it and or have had liked hobbies and you know at one time I was really into dirt bikes wanting to do motocross racing and school I was in gymnastics and snow uh, snow and water skiing uh, rock climbing and backpacking and you know, I, I don't know my mother always said she didn't know why I liked all these extreme sports that were very dangerous but I never thought about the danger in it I was always just enjoying getting rid of some of that extra energy that I had and the, the idea of, of being able to push myself to where I could do really good at something. Um, you know, anything I did, I did 100 plus per percent in it and I just put my all into it. But while I was in school, we had coaches, but I didn't realize how, what the importance, what, how good a coach was. It was like, okay, you know, they're here to kind of tell you what to do. But as, later on, I started getting into uh, racing bicycles and mountain bikes and road bikes. And I was doing mountain bikes. I enjoyed being out in the woods. And then one shop I was racing for, you know, you had, had to, you know, you wore the jersey, you wore the clothes, you looked the part. But then I would get tired. I wasn't doing really well. So they told me, well, you need to cross train with the road bikes to get your heart rate up to, for your aerobic and anaerobic exercise, you know, and, and there's a difference between the two. Uh, John knows probably exactly what I'm talking about. And there's, there's things you do. And, but I still wasn't getting the results I wanted. So I eventually hired an online coach. With that online coach, I gave them you know, my diet plan, I gave him what I ate, I gave him my 
my whole body stats, my heart rate, my blood pressure, my height, my weight, um, and, and I gave them my race schedule. So they knew what my schedule was, and then they would work out a whole workout regiment schedule for me. So I could, you know, so I could do better. And then every race I would give them information on how I did, and then they would tweak my schedule, my race schedule, and tweak my exercise program. And so I could, so I could do better. And, uh, and once the coach had all my stats, you know, I mean, he gave me that whole schedule, which was important. And if I stuck to that schedule, I would, I would do good. If I didn't stick to that schedule and kind of did my own thing, ate what I wanted to and went to bed when I wanted to and did what I wanted to, then it was my own fault that I would fail, right? You know, with life, we need to choose a coach to be either, either successful in life um, or, more importantly, to walk with God, right? God gave us the Holy Spirit as our coach. John 14, 26 says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. Was my coach for racing bikes trying to teach me all things? Well, the Holy Spirit is our comforter. He will teach us all things. And bring all things to our remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 9, 24. He says, know you not that which run a, ra a race run all. So if we run a race, all run, right? But one receiveth a prize. So every time we're out there and, and doing any type of a, what we enjoy, if there's a, any type of competition, there's only one that receives the prize. You know, you have the Olympics, you get three medals. There's only three. There's hundreds of people that participate in, in any event. But only one, only three in the Olympics will get a first, second, third. And, and any prize, any time a race bikes or any anytime, any event, there was first, second, and third place. That's all there was. In big sports events, football and basketball and that sort of, there's only one team that wins. But Paul puts it this way. He says, he says, so run that ye may obtain. And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now do it to obtain a corrupt, they, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. So he is saying here that those who strive for mastery, even though, you know, which is the worldly things, they are tempered all things. I mean, sport people who win races or do that stuff, they have a regiment schedule. They go out, go to bed at a certain time. You got to get proper sleep, proper diet. You, what you put in your mind, how you you know, you eat, drink, and sleep that activity, that sport. Okay, so but Paul says, but we, in the Christian life, an incorruptible crown. That's a key word. It's incorruptible. And I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so I fight, so fight I, not as one that breathe, beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. As we run the race of life, heading toward our ultimate goal of being with Christ for eternity, are we putting our body in subjection? Good question we need to ask ourselves. So Paul says, I bring it into subjection lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So when you're talking to others, make sure that you're given a good report, that you're, given, that you're representing Christ. I hope and believe that everyone who is in earshot of this message today wants and desires to say glory, hallelujah. Praise to our God and Father. When Jesus and the whole host of heaven comes to receive his elect and not be the ones who say, cry for the rocks to fall on us. I trust that everyone, you're here, that you're seeking to be in heaven. So what does it look like to be ready when Jesus comes? That's the question that came to my mind when I asked God to give me something to speak on. What does my life look like? What does your life look like? It's a very important question we should be asking ourselves, especially in these times we're living in. 
What does your life look like, or should it look like, before Jesus comes? Now we know there will be some who are going to heaven, who are living all up to the light that has been given them, and knowledge has been revealed to them, like the thief upon the cross at the last minute. There are those. But you know what? Each of you today, um, but, you know, we all know that each of us here are given more light, and we are held at a higher standard. We have the Word of God in our possession, and we have the Spirit of Prophecy, Ellen G. White's writings. So, there is a statement that is commonly said that I have heard so many interpretations on, and in the Bible, Jesus said, be ye perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. And I've heard so many discussions on this. Why can't we take the Bible as it says, as it reads? That is faith. Trusting that the Bible is true what it says. Let's not twist it around or try to make it something else. Okay? Be ye perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. We will go through this today. In Matthew 7, 21, being perfect is doing the will of the Father in heaven. We can be perfect as Christ is. He gave us our perfect example. Are we going to be tempted? Yes. But you know, God has us in his hands. And Satan will not do anything without us consenting or giving in to him on that temptation. God will keep us where we are unless we give in to Satan. Okay? Matthew 16, 24 says, denying self and following Christ. Self-sacrifice, dying to self and constantly living for Christ. Walking the sanctified life, which is a result of, a, of lifelong obedience. Having the wedding garment on, which is the robe of righteousness. We have this, which I said, the word of God, which is the greater light. And, I, and we also have Ellen G. White's writings, which expound on the word of God and is the lesser light. Sometimes we get it twisted around. We have no excuse. Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools, I don't want to be a fool, I don't want to be counted as a fool, despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 2 if you want to turn there, I'm going to go through Proverbs 2. Some very good counsel here in Proverbs 2. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee. Talking about commandments. So that thou incline thy ear unto wisdom. How do we get wisdom and knowledge? By reading the word of God. And apply thine heart to understanding. Apply. That word apply. We have to apply it. Okay? Proverbs 2, 3. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding. We have to do our, our part. Okay? If thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures. So there's seeking, there's searching, there's crying for knowledge, there's lifting up the voice for understanding. Then, says in, t in verse 5, shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord. Only then will we understand the fear of the Lord. If we do our part in seeking and searching and lifting up our voice to God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk upright. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. So he will preserve us. Thou shalt... Then shalt thou understand righteousness. We, only then we can understand righteousness. If we do our part, and then the Lord will do his part. And judgment and equity, yea, every good path. I think each one of us will wa want to walk in that good path. We don't like walking in the bad paths. Verse 10, when wis wisdom entereth into thy heart, so then the Lord will put his wisdom in our heart once these things are done, once we've seeked after them, once we've searched after them, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. 
Direction shall preserve thee. Understanding shall keep thee to deliver thee from the way of evil. So the only way we can be delivered from the evil of what so, uh, Solomon was saying here through the inspiration of God, the Holy Spirit, is when we cry us after knowledge, asking God for knowledge, lift up our voice for the understanding and say, I want this understanding. Seek her as silver, as treasures, hidden treasures. Then the Lord will do his part. He'll put it into our hearts. And then we will have understanding. And then we could be delivered from the way of the evil man, which is Satan, from the man that speaketh forward things, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the forwardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and they forward in their paths, to deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth her words, which forsaketh the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God. For her house inclineth unto death, and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take thy hold of the paths of life, that thou mayest walk in the way of good men, and keep the paths of righteous. For the upright shall dwell in the land, or dwell in heaven, and the perfect shall remain in it. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth, and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. In the Christian world, I think there are too many so-called cliches or sayings that we quote or use that have really lost some of their meaning. Like, for instance, I'll take, I've taken the word faith. You know, the word faith is only mentioned twice in the Old Testament. Once in Deuteronomy 32, 20, and it says, And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very forward generation children in whom, in whom is no faith. And the other one is in Habakkuk 2.4. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. And in the New Testament, faith is mentioned 245 times. Some of the common ones that we, that we automatically say and remember in our, in our heads, it says, uh, repeated, from Habakkuk 2 4 is the just shall live by faith. For we walk by faith, not by sight. There's another one. For by grace you are saved through faith. Then we talk about take the shield of faith. And then a real common one, Hebrews, on the faith chapter, starts out now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And there are many other quotes. Um, out there that we commonly say, but I just wanted to take that example. Now, we know that to have, you know, th that we'll get into, and I'll get into more of the faith about and explaining so we could dig deeper into it and understand what a true meaning of faith is. So we're not just using these cliches. We need to understand what God is speaking to us in the scriptures and what God requires of us. Okay, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit, okay? And to have the code of righteousness about us, we are to have the fruit of the Spirit. We can't have the code of righteousness around us unless we have the fruit of the Spirit, okay? Fruit of the Spirit, some of you know them right by heart, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. I think they were put in order for a specific reason. And I have to say, is this another one of those verses that get repeated so much that they have lost their true meaning in our lives? Let's see what the Word of God says about the attributes of fruit. Psalms 132, 11. The Lord has sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. So, relates to our body, it, the fruit of it will set upon the throne. 2 Kings 19.30, And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall, ye, shall yet again take root downward. So the remnant of Judah took root downward, because the roots go down. How many of you ever dug up a, a stump and a root ball? I mean, pine tree's got a deep, deep tap root. I mean, I've taken up a, a small 
pine tree and dug it up, and I've had to dig down eight, nine feet down to just pull up the taproot. There may, there's outgrowing roots going this way, but a taproot will go down deep, deep in the ground. That's why you get some heavy windstorms. You won't see these trees topple over. It's a heavy, heavy taproot. We could have a drought like we had this year, but that taproot going down is getting nourishment way down deep in the ground. That's the way we need to ground our, be grounded with the Lord. Have our taproot root down so far deep that it says in 2 Kings 19, 1930, and the last words are, and bear fruit upward. So if we want to bear the fruit of the Spirit upward, we've got to have a good root system. It's Proverbs 11.30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Go to heaven, talk about the tree of life. And he that went his souls is wise. So let us unpack what, is, what it means to have the wedding garment on, or to be put plainly, to be 100% ready when Jesus comes to redeem us as his people. I know the spirit of prophecy says God is waiting for his character to be revealed in each one of us before he comes. So what does that mean? To have Jesus' character revealed in us? Is that just another saying that we say in, in, in the Christian world or the Adventist world? Do we really understand this quote? Let's try to unlock this too. Our scripture reading today, Micah, and in chapter 6, what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly? That's an action, action word, to do justly. Do is action. So we've got to do justly. We've got to treat others correctly. And to love mercy. And to walk humbly with thy God. Not being a proud, a proud person, but to be a humble Christian. Okay? That, that was a question that was asked in the, in the reading. Let's go back to Micah 6 and let's look at it in its context. Verse 6 says, what shall, I come be, what shall I come before the Lord? What shall I bring before the Lord? What are we bringing? It says, and the question is asked, um, you know, it says, I bow myself before the high God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? With calves a year old? So there's a question here. What should I bring to the Lord? What are we bringing to the Lord? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? We already talked about the fruit of the body being laid upon the, upon the temple, right? But, and Micah says here, he says, no, he's shown me this. The Lord has shown me this. He says, what is good and what the Lord required of us, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Very important. Very important that we understand that. When the law of God is written in the heart, talking about that in, these, in our Sabbath school lesson, adult lesson, it will be exhibited in pure and holy life. Be perfect. When the law of God is written in the heart, when we're living it, being written in the heart is when we're living it every day. The commandments of God are not a dead letter. They are spirit and life. Bringing the imaginations and even the thoughts into subjection to the will of Christ. So our thoughts need to be brought into the will of God when the, when the, when the law is written upon our hearts. The heart in which they are written will be kept with all diligence. It's like the athlete. Everything is kept in, in, in diligence. I mean, you're diligent about what you do. So the Christian life is everything is with diligence, not like what John was saying, lukewarm. God does not want lukewarm people. He wants you to, us to make a decision, all right, for him or, for, or not for him. For out of it are the issues of life. All who love Jesus, we all love Jesus, right, and keep the commandments, we look, believe we're keeping commandments, we will seek to avoid the very appearance of evil. Hmm. Pretty serious. We will seek to 
um, avoid the appearance of evil. So when self kind of crops up, that's the appearance of evil. Somebody crosses us, retaliate, that's the appearance of evil. Not because they are constrained thus to do, but because they are copying a peer model and feel averse to everything contrary to law written in their hearts. They will not feel self-sufficient, but their trust will be in God. We've got to have our trust in God, who alone is able to keep them from sin and impurity. Be ye perfect as my Father is, is perfect. The atmosphere surrounding them is pure, so our atmosphere. They will not corrupt their own souls or the souls of others. Hmm. Not only us, but it's those around us. Our influence. It is their pleasure to deal justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before God. That's what it means to do, just, to, to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly before God, like Enoch. Enoch, Enoch was translated without seeing death. Because he did, had those attributes, attributes of the fruit of the Spirit. And like Joseph, when he said, I will not sin against my God. Genesis eighteen nineteen says, For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. Are we commanding our household and our children after, to walk in the way of the Lord? Are we being a living example the priest of the family, are you being a living example to your, to your spouse and to your family and to your children? Good questions. They shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Deuteronomy 10, starting in verse 12, And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee, but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the, the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. 100%. Just like the athlete. If you want to win, if you want to win this race of life, be in heaven. We've got to do it with all our heart and with all our soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you thee this day for thy good. So the Lord commanded us, commanded the children, commands us, it's for our own good. Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is, is the Lord's that thy, Lord's thy God, the earth also with all that therein is. Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people as it is in this day. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart. And he let God do it surgery on our hearts and be no more stiff necked don't let self get in the way for the lord your god is god of gods and lord of lords a great god a mighty and a terrible which regardeth not persons nor taketh reward he doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and the widow and loveth the stranger in giving him food and raiment love ye therefore the stranger it's easy to love each other. We're here, family of God, right? Are we loving the stranger? Are we loving those outside our fold? Are we condemning them? God says, love ye therefore the stranger in the, in the Bible. For ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God. Him shalt thou serve. And to him shalt thou cleave. Cleave. It says, husband and wife, cleave. Be one. Come together and swear by his name. He is thy praise. He is thy God that hath done for thee these great and terrible things, which thine eyes have seen. Thy fathers went down into Egypt with three score and ten persons. And now the Lord thy God hath made thee as the stars of heaven for a multitude. Some powerful words there that God gave in, the, in his word. All right, let's go back to the fruit. John 15, one of, my, one of my favorite texts, just what Jesus said, 
I was talking to the disciples in John 15, telling them that I am the true vine and my Father is the vine dresser. And in here it says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. We don't want to be that unbearing tree or that unbearing branch. We want to have the fruit of the Spirit because we don't want to be taken away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Mm. Do we like that pruning process? I don't like that pruning process, but, you know, we've got to have that pruning process for us to grow bigger fruit and better fruit. You know, how many, how many of you have worked with trees and fruit? I know a few of us in here have some farms and orchards and gardens, but, you know, if you don't take care of that tree, it's going to give too much fruit, and the fruit's going to be small, and it's not going to, it's, it, it's not going to be really good fruit. But if you take care of it and prune it back and, and prune off some of the early fruit and leave, leave some of the other ones and take care of it correctly, it's going to produce some good fruit. So that's, what, that's that pruning process that Jesus has to do in each of us. If we want to be good quality Christians, be ready when Jesus comes, we've got to allow him to work on us and to prune us, to do that pruning process. You are, already, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So God says we're already clean. We're already there. But he says, you need to continually abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. And then goes down further and it talks about, it says, by this, my fa- in verse 8, my father's glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So if we want to be the disciples of God and true disciples, we will bear the fruit. So what is this fruit that we've got to bear? Love. Love is the first attributes of the fruit of the Spirit. Why is that first? I put unconditional love. Because if you don't have love, you can't have any of the others. There is no way that it's going to work. Philippians 2, 3 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better themselves. That's unconditional love. Esteeming others better than yourselves. Putting others first. Is that easy to do? Not always. No. Uh Uh-uh. It's something we need God's help with. Right? The next attribute is joy. So the only way we could have joy is if we have love. And we will get joy from esteeming others better than ourselves. You can have joy, when you, like I said, when you esteem others better than yourself. John 15, 11 says, These things I have spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you. So who gives us joy? God gives us joy. And that your joy might be full. We want our joy full. Then there's peace. We will have peace after we have love for one another, esteeming others better than ourselves, and then we'll be joyous, we'll be happy, and then he gives us peace. I know I, I like to have peace, and it says you cannot have peace unless you have the unconditional love for others. Psalms 119, 165, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Hmm. Nothing will offend us when we have that peace. Isaiah 26, 3. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. So when our mind is stayed upon Christ, we will have perfect peace because he trusts in you. So when we trust in God, it's that faith in God, that trust in God will give us that perfect peace. James 3, 18 says, And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. That's powerful. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Hmm. So we can only have the fruit of righteousness sown in us uh, when we make peace, when we are peaceful around others. The word long-suffering is made up of two Greek words, meaning long and temper, literally long-tempered. So long-suffering is actually long-tempered. To be long-suffering, then, is to have self-restraint. Hmm. Put a restraint. You know, like, like horses, we put a, a bridle on them to 
to guide them to the right, to guide them to the left, to stop them, slow them down. You know, they want it. They, sometimes, I mean, I've been on a horse that just wanted to just go. But, you know, kept pulling back, kept pulling back. But once I let those reins go, that horse just, whoo, you know, scary ride. <laughs> they just wanted to go. But you know what? It says, it says it's a self-restraint which one is stirred at, when, when one is stirred to anger. So long-suffering is a self-restraint. Let's see what Paul has to say about God's long-suffering. In Romans 9.21, it says, Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? Hmm. So God was long-suffering, restrained back his power. We know that been studying Moses, you know, and, and dealing with the children of Israel so many times. And, and at one time, God wanted it. Moses pleaded for their case. Moses was long-suffering, you know. God was long-suffering in grace and mercy many times, and he is with us too. And that he might make known the riches of his glory in the vessels of mercy, hmm. which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called not of Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. In other words, gentleness. We often think as gentleness as tender or even softness. But the biblical gentleness is more than that. Listen to this. The biblical gentleness involves having a humble heart and being kind towards others. That's powerful having a humble heart and being kind toward, uh, towards others. Let's go back and, and look at what I spoke to this morning, children, about Peter in Matthew 14. Talk about gentleness, Matthew 14. Christ had a gentle spirit with Peter. 20, verse 22 Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent his multitude away. And when he had sent the multitude away, he would upon the mountain by himself to pray. Very key point there. If we want to have the fruit of the Spirit, we need to continually be in prayer with our Father. We need to have that channel open so God, the Holy Spirit, can be there to, to be our coach. Let the, we need to let the Holy Spirit be our coach and guide us. All right, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. So such important, verse twenty-three. Now, when evening came, he was all he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, in the fourth watch, fourth watch was close to dawn. That was the last the last watch of the night. Jesus went to them walking on the sea, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled saying, it is a ghost, and they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you and walk on the water. But Jesus, with his gentleness, he was very gentle in his spirit, he says, he says be of good cheer. They're in a storm. When we're in a storm, do we listen to God say, be of good cheer? It is I. Do not be afraid. Do we let God lead us and guide us through our storms in our life? Or are we trying to do it ourselves? Are we trying to handle these things on our own? We can't do it on our own. Good, goodness. Next attribute of the um, fruit of the Spirit. God's goodness is described as abundant, enduring, and universal. Psalms 23, 6 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Galatians 6, 10 says, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. So goodness, do good unto all men, not just a select few especially unto them who are of the household of faith. 
How many times do we treat strangers better than the ones closest to us? It says right there in Galatians 6.10, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Sometimes those who are closest to us, we don't treat as good as we treat sometimes a stranger. We have a little more mercy and grace towards a stranger sometimes. I know that happens sometimes, you know, when our spouses are the closest to us. And we're, sometimes we don't treat them the best. We talk harsh. We talk rough. We get irritated easily. We tend to see their defects and we want to judge and we forget our own defects. But it says, let us do good unto all men, especially, especially, especially unto them who are of the household of faith especially to our family members, especially to our church family. The last attribute of the fruit of the Spirit is faith. The substance and the shape of a Christian faith and life is drawn from the main course of what is taught in the Bible. True faith is believing that the Bible will do what it says it will do in our lives. Because this book says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Okay? It is profitable for doctrine. What is doctrine? It's from the Latin word doctrina, meaning teaching and instruction. So it's, it's profitable for teaching and for instruction. For reproof. Reproof is to rebuke someone. It means to correct him or instruct him. So it's correcting and instructing. Proverbs 13.1 says, A wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. Hmm. So I want to be wise. I'm going to hear my Father in Heaven's instruction. The Bible teaches that the purpose of, purpose of rebuke is to bring about repentance. So when we are doing what the Scripture says, that for rebuke or reproof, are we doing it? out of seeking someone's best interest and for repentance. Luke 17, 3 says, Take heed to yourself. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. Don't just chastise and rebuke him, because it goes on further in this text, and it says, If he repent, forgive him. So it's for repentance. Strictly for repentance. Rebuke is not to, be put some, no, is not to put someone down, or to put so and so in his place. It is to bring repentance meekness meekness is one of the most commonly misunderstood terms applied to godliness it is enduring energy with patience and without resentment meekness is endure it's enduring injury with patience and without resentment galatians 5:23 gives us an example of meekness as meekness temperance against such there is no law We've got to be meek, meek and mild. It says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. We've got to restore them in meekness. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So if we aren't meek, we could be tempted and fall in the same path. Ephesians 4, 2 says, With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Colossians 3.12 says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness and long-suffering. 1 Timothy 6.11 says, But thou, O man of God, which each one of us were believe were followers of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. In 2 Timothy 2.25, it says, In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God, preadventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So in meekness, we've got to do instructing others in meekness. Titus 3.2 says, To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. 
So we don't need to be speaking evil of anyone. And now this is the last attribute of the fruit of the Spirit. I, I had said it incorrectly before. It says temperance. So at the end, there's temperance. What is temperance? Temperance is self-control. So what is self-control? A few Bible examples would be Joseph, which I mentioned earlier. When Potiphar tried to have, Potiphar's wife tried to have a way with him, and he pushed her away and says, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? That's temperance. What about Daniel and being thrown in the lion's den because of his self-control or temperance and not giving in to the king's command? What about the three Hebrews who wouldn't bow down to the golden image and were thrown in the fiery furnace? That was temperance. They stood for God instead of following the masses. Being perfect is all these attributes in our character. The latter rain is about to fall upon the people of God. A mighty angel is to come down from heaven, and the earth is to be lighted with his glory. Are we ready to take part in the glorious work of the third angel? Are our vessels ready to receive the heavenly dew? Have we defilement and sin in our heart? If, let, if so, let us cleanse the soul temple and prepare for the showers of the latter rain. The refreshing from the presence of the Lord will never come to hearts filled with impurity. Did you hear that? The refreshing from the presence of the Lord will never come to hearts filled with impurity. And our lamps trimmed and filled with the oil, our lamps filled and trimmed with the oil, the Holy Spirit. Or is your character like Christ's character, and are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Trimming our lamps is continually communication with God through the Word of God and through prayer. Being filled with the oil is filled with the Holy Spirit daily. And letting the Holy Spirit coach us and guide us and bring us into all remembrance. Are we allowing God and asking God to be baptized us afresh a day, every day of the Holy Spirit with heartfelt meaning? May God help us to die to self, that Christ, the hope of glory, may be formed within, within us. I want you to listen to these words from a, a hymn that I penned in here. It said, the hymn is, Jesus, I my cross have taken. Jesus, I my cross have taken, all to leave and follow thee. Are we taking the cross of Jesus? All things else I have forsaken. Thou from hence my heart shall be. Perish every fond ambition, all life so, or hoped or known. Yet how rich is my condition, while I prove the Lord my own. Let the world despise and leave me, they have left my Savior too. Human hearts and looks deceive me, thou art faithful. Thou art true. Oh, tis not in grief to harm me, while thy love is left to me. Oh, twere not in joy to charm me, if that love be hid from me. Soul, then know thy full salvation. Rise o'er sin and fear and care. Joy to find in every station something still to do or bear. Think what spirit dwells within thee. Think what father's smiles are thine. Think that Jesus died to win thee. Child of Eve, canst thou repine? Hadst thee on from grace to glory, armed by faith and winged by prayer. Heaven's eternal day before thee. God's own hand shall guide thee there. Soon shall close thy pilgrim days. Hope shall change to glad fruition. Faith to sight and prayer to praise. May this be our prayer. As we listen to Jeannie and Pam sing us this song.
name of the Bible is Jesus, and how he died to save men. The plan of salvation assures us he's coming back again. Are you ready for Jesus? sing the rest of the song. Are you ready for Jesus to come? Maybe uh, there's something in your heart, maybe there's something in your life that you're just holding on to. Maybe self is getting in the way. Maybe you're estranged with a family member. Maybe there's a family member that doesn't want to talk to you anymore. Are we making it right with them? I know some people don't like coming up front, but even if you have in your heart, how many would like to recommit their lives to God today? And make sure that we are ready for Jesus to come. That we are living the life that he has asked us to live. We can live that perfect life. He gave us the example. Jesus on this earth gave us a perfect example. It's not out of reach. Too many of us want to say... Well, it's this or that. The Bible says, be perfect as my Father is perfect. It's a continue, sanctified walk with God every day, every minute, every hour. Before I add prayer, I'll let them sing the last verse. Don't cling to the world and its treasure. This earth will soon pass away. Oh, give him your love without measure. He's calling you today. Are you ready for Jesus to come? Are you faithful in all that you do? Have you fought a good fight? Have you stood for the right? Have others seen Jesus in you? Are you ready to stand in your place? Are you ready to look on his face? Can you look up and say, This is my Lord? Are you ready for Jesus?
please stand with me and reverently bow your heads before our Lord and Savior. Our Father God in heaven, you saw the hands raised. Lord, we want to say as we look upon your face, this is my God in whom I believe. Lord, please reveal to each one of us where we are erring. We ask for a pruning process in our lives. We want to reflect your character. We want to bear the fruit of the Spirit. We want to have the love, peace, joy, long-suffering and mercy and grace and temperance and faith, Lord. That when you come, you will say, I have found faith with my people. And may each one of us be ready. And Lord, that we let the Holy Spirit work in and through each one of us in our thoughts and our actions and our words. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Please be seated.